Well, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to deliver the second of the holiday lectures. This lecture is going to be about vision, and we're going to concentrate on the events that occur in the eye. And I want to start by contrasting the eye to a familiar eye-like uh, man-made object, a camera. If I could have the first slide, we're going to see uh, a cross-section of a human eye. This is made from uh, the eye of a cadaver. Uh, it was uh, sliced at a thickness of about a hundredth of a millimeter and stained with various chemicals that make the tissues uh, appear easier to see. Now, the left uh, here is the front of the eye. The right is the back of the eye. Light, of course, enters uh, from the front. It passes through the cornea, which is a thick but clear layer of tissue. And the only light that is allowed to enter the eye proper has to pass through this hole uh, formed by the iris. The iris uh, is up above and down below. Of course, this is in cross-section, so the whole structure is actually like a donut. It's a circle. That's the, that's the dark part of the eye you see when you say someone has a particular eye color. Of course, the very center, the hole, looks completely black. That's the pupil. Why does it look black? Well, it looks black because no light is coming out. A light basically only comes in. Very little comes out. Now, once light uh, uh, traverses this passageway, it's uh, refracted by the lens, which is shown here. And then the image is formed on the back wall of the eye. This, of course, would be analogous to where the film is in a camera. In a retina, the back wall of the eye is lined by a thin layer of neural tissue. It's actually part of the nervous system. It's called the retina. So the retina is really functionally analogous to the film in a camera. Now, uh, let's look at some of the things that happen, both in a camera and in the eye, uh, in response to different levels of illumination. A camera has several mechanisms to change its sensitivity. It can crank down the aperture, and that would be the diaphragm, to allow less light, or it can open it up more to allow more light. Uh, it also uses a timed opening and closing mechanism, a shutter, to allow light in for just a brief period of time. And of course, there's no biological analog of that. We don't, uh, we, of course, we could blink our eyes, but we really don't do it that way. Uh, we keep our eyes open pretty much all the time, so our eyes are much more perhaps like a video camera than a still camera. And finally, uh, you can change the film in a camera if you want to change its sensitivity. But any particular piece of film has a particular sensitivity. It's indicated by the ASA rating, and you can't change that. If it's ASA 100, then that's what it is. Now, the retina doesn't have that option. It's the same retina that's in there all the time. And so to change sensitivity, uh, we need to adjust the system uh, without actually changing components. And that's perhaps the most uh, remarkable difference between the two. First, just starting from the front of the eye, let me indicate that we do have the option of changing the aperture here. We can change the opening of the pupil by a factor of about 15. Not a big factor, but significant. That's easy to demonstrate. It's, it's actually fun to do with a friend. You can go into a dim room, dimly lit room, and take a flashlight and shine it in one eye and observe the other. The other uh, pupil will constrict. Actually, that is not only a nice demonstration of the constriction mechanism and the fact that it is in response to light, but it also tells you that it's not autonomous to each eye. In fact, what's happening is your brain is assessing how much light is coming in, and then it's telling both eyes uh, that they ought to constrict equally, which in fact they do. Now, um, before we talk in detail about uh, dark adaptation uh, and events in the retina, let me just mention one other interesting uh, difference between an eye and a camera. In a camera, when you focus, you move the lens. Here, I'm pretending this is a camera. You move it either forward if the object to be imaged is close, or you move it back if it's further away. In the eye, it's a completely different uh, strategy. The lens itself doesn't move backwards or forwards, but because it's made of biological material, it's somewhat deformable. And so there's a ring of muscle around the lens, and it constricts to make it rounder, which then uh, makes it refract light more. So when you look at something close up, your lens is getting rounder, and when you look at something further away, it's getting flatter. Of course, you can't do that with a piece of glass, so that's not an option in a camera. Now, let's talk in detail about really the most remarkable difference between a camera and an eye, and that's, that's in the light-absorbing layer itself. This is the retina. And on the next slide, uh, we see a high-power view, an electron micrograph, of the retina of an amphibian, uh, most of the cells here, these objects are single cells, are called rods. They have single uh, 
cylindrical appendages that uh, stick out actually away from the light. Light actually has to traverse the full width of the retina to get here, and then it's absorbed in these outer segments. The outer segments have within them the light-absorbing protein called uh, visual pigment. That's the generic name. We have different names for the different kinds of pigments in different kinds of photoreceptor cells. In rods, that pigment would be called rhodopsin. That's in these big cells. There are also little cells called cones. In humans, there are three different types, and they have what we call cone pigments. Each kind of cell has only one kind of pigment. A, rhodops uh, a rod cell has only rhodopsin, and each kind of cone has just one of the three different kinds of cone pigments. And we'll, we'll return in more detail at the end of the lecture to those pigments. Now, when you go from, uh, say, a sunny afternoon to a dark room, say, a movie theater, I think we've all experienced the fact that it takes some time to get used to the dark. At first, you can't see very well, and then maybe five or 10 minutes later, you can see better. Well, what's happening during that five or 10 minutes? Well, the first thing that's happening, and it happens quickly, is your pupil is enlarging to admit more light. But the fact is that when you're outside on a sunny afternoon, there's about a million-fold more photons. Photons are the particles of light than there are in a dark movie theater. And so that factor of 15 doesn't get you very far. Most of what changes is changing in your retina. So what's happening is that from moment to moment, the cells in the retina are constantly assessing how much light is hitting them. And if it's the second or third order cells, that they're assessing what sort of signal they're getting from the photoreceptors themselves. And they're, and they're recalibrating their sensitivity to match the ambient light level. That's something that Polaroid would love to have in its film. But no film has ever been built that has that. Now, uh, there's actually an interesting uh, uh, dualism here, because uh, in addition to the adjustment uh, within a single cell from moment to moment, the retina actually switches from one set of photoreceptors to another. Rods are more sensitive than cones by about a factor of 100. And uh, you use them under dim light conditions. But in bright light, you use your cones only, and the rods are saturated. So that gets you a factor of 100, switching from rod vision to cone vision. <clears throat> now, on the next slide, we're going to look at a rod cell uh, schematically. This is now lying on its side. And here's the top of the cell. This is the outer segment. And I want you to just realize that the outer segment has a particular internal structure. It has a series of flattened sacks of membranes. Uh, there are about 1,000 of them in a typical rod. They're stacked like a stack of pancakes. And the visual pigment sits in the membrane of those uh, saccules. Of course, when, when light is absorbed here, it eventually has to create a signal, which then flows down the cell to its synaptic terminal and then on to the second order neuron. Now, let's look uh, the way an engineer would look at the response of these cells to light. And I'm going to show you a, a series of slides that have this general layout. That is, time is on the horizontal axis, and then uh, a stimulus or a response is on the vertical axis. So this would be, for instance, uh, a light stimulus. Here the light is off. Now we turn the light on for some length of time, and then we turn the light off, uh, and then it remains off. How does the cell respond? Well, if any engineer was building uh, a sensory system, uh, he would want or she would want a rapid response, and so the we see this big response that's uh, quite rapid. And then it would, uh, it would be built with a rapid recovery phase. So we're back down to baseline. Of course, that's important, because if it didn't recover, you'd be seeing the same image all the time. It would remain imprinted on your retina. What you want is to be able to wipe the slate clean and have a fresh uh, slate ready for a new image. There are two other features I want to draw your attention to. One is that it would be nice to have a large amplification. Jim Hudspeth. Uh, mentioned this in his lecture, that is, we'd like to detect small stimuli, maybe a, a very dim flash of light, and the cell needs to respond with a big enough punch that it gets your attention. And related to that, we need a steady baseline. If this baseline, in the absence of light, were fluctuating a lot, then it would obscure a signal. And that uh, pair of variables, that is, the signal and the noise, are what sets the ultimate sensitivity of the system. Now let's look in uh, somewhat schematic form at the events that occur in a photoreceptor cell. There's clearly very strong selective pressure for great sensitivity in the visual system. Whether you're a pre whether you're predator or prey, it helps uh, if you're out at night to be able to see what's going on around you. And 
this cannot be achieved just by activating a single receptor molecule and having that activation itself be the final readout. It needs to be amplified, and the amplification occurs through a series of enzymatic reactions. These are diagrammed here. R is the receptor molecule, rhodopsin, in the absence of light. Light converts it within about a millionth of a second into an active form. We'll call it R star. Now, R star, it turns out, is an enzyme. Remember, an enzyme is a catalyst. It catalyzes a chemical reaction, but it itself is not consumed in the reaction. Once it catalyzes the reaction, it can go on to catalyze a second one, and a third one, and a fourth, and so on. And the reaction it catalyzes, just shown schematically here, is the conversion of uh, a protein A into a different form called A star. Now, it turns out that rhodopsin, during its lifetime of, say, 100 milliseconds, catalyzes about 100 of these conversions. Of course, this has to be fast. If it weren't fast, we couldn't play baseball, right? Uh, it's got to be on the order of uh, 10 to 100 milliseconds to hit a baseball. And now, if that were all that happened, we would get about 100-fold amplification. That is, one photon was absorbed by rhodopsin, and now we've got 100 of these conversions. But that isn't good enough. The system needs more amplification than that. And so it turns out that A star is itself an enzyme. And A star catalyzes the conversion of B to B star. And during the lifetime of A star, again, on the order of 100 milliseconds, about 1,000 of these B to B star events uh, are catalyzed. So now we have an amplification fold of 100 times 1,000. That is 100,000 fold. And that's big enough for the cell to respond to a single photon. Now, uh, one thing I should mention is that there is a mechanism for turnoff of the system. That is a reconversion of R star back to R, of A star back to A, and B star back to B. And that's the wiping the slate clean. And that also occurs very quickly, again, within 100 milliseconds. Now, on the next slide, we see that this amplification has a certain price in terms of time resolution. Here, again, we have time on the horizontal axis. And I'm going to show you the, the responses, the, the theoretical response curves of three different systems. The rightmost one is the way it actually works. That is, uh, R to R star, A to A star, B to B star. But suppose it were just R to R star. Well, that would be, as I mentioned, very fast. It would take about a millionth of a second. And so you'd get a very rapid rise in the response. That's great for uh, time resolution, but it's not very good for sensitivity. If all we uh, did was monitor the A to A star transition, that would be a little bit better in terms of sensitivity, and we get a linear increase. As additional A stars are generated, we get a linear increase in the signal over time. But the way the system really works, that is, uh, a cascade of enzyme reactions with B to B star being the final output, there's a delay. It's a parabolic curve. And so it takes a while for the system to get going, but once it gets going, it packs a big punch. And apparently, that trade-off is worth it for the system. Now, this is especially slow under dim light conditions. And you may have experienced this if you go out uh, at twilight uh, when there isn't much light around. First, it's hard to read quickly, because reading is a uh, chore that, if you do it well, is a, is a rapid visual task. It's hard to hit a baseball if someone uh, pitches it to you, and so on. And that's because vision is slow. It's not that your muscular movements have gotten slower. The problem is in your retina because of this delay time here. Now, on the next slide, uh, I want to take you through <coughs> the responses of single photoreceptor cells. And we're going to use this as a prelude to looking at the question of how sensitive the human retina is, actually how sensitive the human organism is. First, let's look at the responses of a photoreceptor cell to light. Now, here, we're going to indicate little flashes of light by these vertical lines uh, on the stimulus trace. Again, this is time on the horizontal axis. And in the case of photoreceptor cells, we usually, we usually plot the response as a downward blip, just convention. So if we give a little tiny uh, flash of light, we see a small blip. If we give a bigger flash, we see a bigger blip. If we give a great big flash, we get a blip that eventually saturates. OK, so there's no, no surprise here. This is how any sensory system would work. On the next slide, we see an interesting experiment. If we do uh, the same sort of uh, stimulus response analysis, but with very, very dim flashes of light. So that's diagram down here. Every 10 seconds, we're going to give a tiny flash of light to this photoreceptor cell. 
we can ask what the responses look like. And what we see is that uh, first, some of the time, for instance here, when there's a flash of light, there is no response at all. That is, the flash is so dim that a photon, no photons were captured by the photoreceptor cell. It failed to capture a photon. At other times, we get a little blip, and the blips resemble one another uh, quite closely. And these are the responses to single photons. That's the ultimate physical limit because uh, light comes in quanta, that is in discrete units, we call them photons, and you can't break them up any further. You can't cut a photon in half. So the photoreceptor has achieved the ultimate physical limit of sensitivity. But let me show you another experiment on the next slide, which uh, makes this a little more complicated from the point of view of the organism. This is the response of a photoreceptor cell in absolute darkness. Here, there's no light. Uh, uh, shining on the cell. And what you see is every now and again, and notice that the time scale is expanded. Here's 100 seconds, 200, 300. Every now and again, the photoreceptor gives a little blip. What's that? Those are spontaneous activations of rhodopsin, thermal activations. Remember, at room temperature or body temperature, things are always jiggling around a little bit. And so nothing is perfectly stable. And every now and again, a rhodopsin uh, is converted from an R to an R star form, even in the absence of light. Now this, uh, you might say, doesn't uh, look like a very impressive performance here, since this is basically crying wolf in the absence of light. But let me note that each photoreceptor cell has about 10 million rhodopsins. And since a photoreceptor cell typically gives one of these thermal activations once per minute, that on a per rhodopsin basis, I'll let you do the math uh, to con convince yourself this is right, but on a rhodopsin basis, each molecule is stable for about 20 years. It doesn't cry wolf uh, until, on average, about 20 years. So that's pretty good for a protein. But uh, in terms of the whole organism, that presents a problem, because this is a background noise that's indistinguishable from the bona fide signal, that is a light absorption event. And on the next slide, uh, we're going to look at uh, perhaps uh, the most famous experiment in human visual physiology, the determination of how the system gets around that problem of background noise, and ultimately, what is the absolute sensitivity that's achievable by human vision. The problem is basically that uh, your brain receives from the retina the input, or I should say the output, of many photoreceptor cells. And the ganglion cells in the retina, the ones that send their axons to the brain, have in the peripheral retina, where you're most sensitive to light, received the messages from about 500 photoreceptor cells. Now those cells, as I mentioned, are sending these false signals about once a minute per cell. So each ganglion cell is constantly being bombarded with these false signals. How does it know when one of them is uh, a bona fide signal? Let's say when a number of uh, photons, 10 or 20 or 30, have been absorbed as opposed to this rumbly background. And this uh, was investigated by Selig Hecht about 60 years ago in this lovely experiment. And the experiment is of the simplest sort. That is, you just put someone in a dark room and you allow them to observe very dim flashes of light and you ask them what they see. You ask them for each flash of light, did they see it or did they not? Now, of course, uh, at the extreme of dim flashes, no one can see them. And so the answer is no. And of course, at the other extreme, when the flashes are bright, you see them every time. It's the in-between part that's important. Now, it turns out that if you try different intensities of light, different flash intensities, you observe that the subject responds uh, with a, yes, I did see it, as the intensity increases, and that the steepness of the response curve uh, is of a particular shape, and it's a particular steepness, and it's that steepness of the response curve that tells you how many photon absorptions are required for a subject to see the light. And let me explain how that works. Let's consider, just uh, as a hypothetical, that you require 50 or more photons to be absorbed to say, I see it. And let's consider those flashes of light that on average cause 30 photons to be absorbed by the retina. Now, when I say on average, that's important because any given flash delivers not necessarily the average number of 30. Some flashes will deliver more, and some will deliver less. Why is that? Well, it's because, that, it's because the light that is emerging from the filament of the light bulb, the photons that are emerging 
emerge as independent events. A photon that emerges at one place from the filament from that light bulb doesn't know what another photon somewhere else is doing. They emerge independently and at random. And so some flashes of light will deliver perhaps 40 photons, some 20, some 30, and so on. And furthermore, the absorption itself fluctuates randomly. Since there are many rhodopsin molecules out there waiting for light, uh, an absorption event over here is uncorrelated with one somewhere else on the retina. So from one flash to the next, even with the light bulb set at the same intensity, there are going to be different numbers of photons captured. All we can say is for that particular uh, intensity where the light is set, what the average number of photons might be coming from the light bulb. And that's shown here. So here we have, for example, uh, a setting in which there's an average of 30 photons being captured. And remember, we're, we're assuming here that you need 50 or more to say you saw it. So if one were to uh, deliver this sort of stimulus repeatedly to a subject, the fraction of times that they would see it, that is the fraction of times it would deliver 50 or more photons, would just be the area under the curve starting at this point 50 and to the right. That is, very few of these trials would deliver 50 or more photons. Now, what if uh, we increase the intensity of the light? Let's make it, uh, say, 50 photons on average uh, per flash. Now, of course, if it's an average of 50 and you need 50 or more, then half the time you'll see it, half the time you won't. What if we were deliver, to, to deliver, say, 70 photons on average? Well, 70 is more than 50, so most of the time you will get above that threshold number of photons captured, and most of the time you'll see it. In fact, the vast majority, because if the average number is 70, there will be very few instances in which 50 or fewer, or I should say 49 or fewer, were captured. The reason for that, in this example with a large number of photons, is that when the number is large, the distribution is narrow. And this is the key point to the experiment. This is easy to see with tossing a coin. If you have a free Saturday sometime, I recommend this experiment. Take a penny and toss it 1,000 times and count the number of heads. Well, make it 10,000. You're young. There's plenty of time. Uh, what you'll find if you do it 1,000 times is that almost certainly the number of heads will be between 400 and 600. It won't necessarily be exactly 500. In fact, it probably won't. But it's likely to be rather close to the expected value of 500. On the other hand, if you flip it only 10 times, it's much more likely that you will get a value of the number of heads that's rather different from five, relatively more different, say three heads or seven heads. And the reason for that is that the relative fluctuations are greater when the numbers are smaller. This is just called the law of large numbers. And now in the next slide, uh, we see the uh, sharpness of this curve, the sharp transition for this particular example between not seeing a light. So this is the, on the vertical axis, the subject reporting that they saw a light, they saw the frequency with which they saw it, 100% up here, 0% down here. And if we need to see 50 or more photons, if we need to capture 50 or more photons, then there's a sharp transition between not seeing anything and seeing it every time as the average number of photons captured per trial increases. Now let's have the next slide and see what happens if that number were smaller. Suppose we need to capture only five or more photons. And let's again consider a light that delivers three-fifths the number that we would need. So in this case, it would be three. Now in this case, because the number is small and because fluctuations are relatively larger with small numbers, the curve is broader, relatively broader. So, if, so a light that delivers on average three photons per flash will uh, not infrequently deliver two or one or even zero or four or five or six. And now if we need to capture five or more, the area under the curve is not insignificant out here. And on the next slide, we see the resulting frequency of seeing curve. That is, it's a shallow curve. As we increase the light intensity, number of photons captured per trial from zero to 10, we get a gradual increase in the subject reporting that they saw the light. Again, it's because of the fluctuations that are great when the numbers are small. When Selig Heck did this experiment, he found that the dark adapted human could reliably detect five to seven photons, a very small number. Let me give you some sense of how small this is. I'm going to compare it to the somatosensory system. We're free to bash the somatosensory system in this pair of lectures, by the way, because we're talking about hearing and vision. So that's going to be our straw man. I have here a dime. Dime weighs about a gram. If I hold the dime 
uh, about a tenth of a millimeter above my skin and then drop it, I can just barely feel the effect of dropping that dime. So uh, that is something that's near the threshold for, sen for the sensitivity of my somatosensory system, my touch receptors. Now suppose we were to convert the potential energy that was lost by dropping that dime, a tenth of a millimeter, into photons, into light. How much light would we have? And in particular, how much uh, would we have with respect to how many people could see that flash of light? Would it be enough for one person to see it? Ten people? A hundred? A thousand? I'll leave it to you and your physics teacher to get the exact number. It's an easy calculation. But it turns out that flash would be plenty strong to be seen by every human being on the face of the Earth. Now that means that a fully dark adapted human eye is extremely sensitive. And the only reason we can see, uh, say, five to seven and not two or three photons is because of that rumbly background noise, that occasional firing of rod photoreceptors. That noise sets the absolute limit of human visual sensitivity. Now let's turn our attention to color vision. And uh, I want to first just 